Good morning, and it's Caroline Williams here in sunny Wales. I always have a sunny Friday for some reason with special guests, and my special guest is the lovely Susie Walker. And I won't, I won't, I, <laughs> Susie and I have had a, a brief chat before, before recording, but um, I would say to everybody listening and watching that Susie is one of my inspirational people um, in my life. So I wanted to say that before she starts explaining what, what she is and who she is and where she is and her why, because Susie wrote a book called Making the Big Leap and it was on the bookshelves around about 2003, 2004. And I remember looking at it and I remember thinking, I really want something to lift me up here because I was in um, in between jobs. I had a contract with Ford Motor Company. I was going to London to get retrained and I was in what I call a low phase. So I saw the book and the making the leap was the leap at, from the page, from the book cover. And I bought it and I read it. So whenever I go to London, I'll always have a book that inspires wow. me. So. Susie, welcome. Tell us who you are. Oh, it's so, so funny. It's a great question because we've just been writing a dossier about um, something called Internal Family Systems, uh, created by a guy called Richard Schwartz. And he says, you know, I, I, we haven't got a fixed identity and that we've got all of these different parts of ourselves. And I, I read it and I, I mean, I know him and I think he's brilliant. But I read the dossier and I just thought, wow, I'm so I felt so relieved because there's there's so many different parts of me. There's the wounded child, there's the leader, there's the fabulous, there's the fun, there's all sorts of things. So I suppose for me, who am I? It's like who who do I choose to put the attention on? I think in my past, I think I um probably put a lot of attention on the wailing inner child <laughs> or my my horrible inner pessimist, as I call it, my inner critic. And when they rule your life, you're really, really screwed. Um, and what I've learned through self-development to do is to kind of really get in touch with another part of myself, which is the wise self or your best you, or to me, it's the kind of, it's the kind of Jedi Knight within <laughs> uh, who, who knows what to do and how to operate through life. But I also have in the same, instance I have still have the wailing child and the rebel who's smoking behind the bike sheds and uh, all of those parts of me but it's just they're no longer in charge most of the time <laughs> and I, I, I have a kind of oh hopefully know that I've got this wiser part of me that can um, be the leader in my inner world. I identify with the rebel in you I, I am a rebel yeah. still am yeah, I identify, <laughs> and yeah. I ident yes, and I identify with the wailing child, but I I had a different kind of um, experience to the wailing child because I had an accident which meant my my jaw was wired, so the wailing was smothered, and that that happened when I when was, was that that was when I was eleven twelve, and I had gone to Germany with my father. Because, you know, he would take, if we were good, well behaved, he would say, right, you can come with me to Germany. So off we went to Germany. And because I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a sporting, I would say, um, adrenaline junkie, I saw bikes in the garage and they had lots of bikes because they were quite wealthy, the people we stayed with. And I just challenged the children because I was, um, they were teenagers then, I said, you know, would you like to ride the bike? And yes, come on. Not realizing they were on a hill, the house. Mm. And apparently, I've learned badly that whereas we we break from the handlebars on a bike, the European system is yeah, the European system is backpedaling. So of course I didn't ask how to break the bike. So there oh. I was going down a hill. Yes. So I ended up in a, a brand new hospital. It was actually brand new called Heidenheim. And they were pioneering there because they were using herbal medicine. They were using things wow. like 
chamomile uh -huh. tea, chamomile tea. So I had a spout here with chamomile tea and they were using chamomile cream for everything. Oh. So it's oh. quite a forward thinking. To heal. I had reconstruction work, you see, because the jaw, this one, this side of the jaw is disintegrating, but it was to do with the teeth. So I was, I was what, so come back to the wailing child. I was like this. So I never told anybody what happened. I never told even my parents because they were so distraught. So I'd see them distraught. So I just kept everything down, which obviously. I think it's an, think it's an interesting age as well, 11, 12. Um, it, I mean, it's where young girls are developing and also coming into your power. I think that's a, you know, having seen my son and his friends who are girls go through this, you know, that they're going to big school, you're learning about what makes you powerful and what not. So it's interesting that I wonder, I wonder how it affected you emotionally and psychologically. Quite a lot. So I used to get flashbacks. So it's now known as post-traumatic stress. Yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd have nightmares, you see. So that went yeah. on until I was 40. It all went on until I was 40. And when How did I, you heal it? How did you heal it? I, I think it was ju just the brain saying, this isn't right, do it, sort it, you know. And it's, it's like a self-chatter all the time. Sort this out, this is not, you know, good for you. It's not right for you, da da da, da. Yeah. So I went, I do everything in, in a very difficult way. I went and saw counselling from Swansea University was piloting, piloting the um, counselling course. So that was 91. Amazing. And I looked at it and I was going through a really horrific divorce and it was horrific. And I looked at it and I thought the only thing that's going to save me mentally, not physically, mentally, is to do something like that. So I, I, I signed up. It was 91 to 93. I did it and I, I was still going through the horrific divorce while I was doing it. So I made a friend of the person who was leading it and her name is Pat Beardsworth. So she was the director for this counseling course. So she really knew throughout the course that I was struggling. So she said, do you want some treatment? And I said, well, yes, what, what can you offer? So this is 91. And she said, hypnotherapy. Ah. So I had to, um, she had like a, a place not far from where I lived in the uplands in Swansea. And I went along and she said, um, have you had a hypnotherapy before? No. So, well, she, and then she went into the, 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 the room and showed me and all I could see was the Buddhist, Buddhist titles of her books on the background. That's the first time I realized she was a Buddhist. Yeah. So the Buddhist director, was okay. taking this course so they they title it advanced counseling and then they go swansea university healthcare unit so that was the the, the unit that i went to yeah for all that time to get all this but underneath did you got, train as a counselor yes you trained there yes yeah but i went you see i'm one of these people that if i have somebody towards you know if i'm i'm dealing with somebody who's going through something really horrific and I have no idea that for me, if I've already got issues, that's not gonna work. So I knew I had a lot of things that I had to sort out. Yes. So well, that, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's why I went along to her to get hypnotized. And you know what happened after the, the, um, the first session? Yeah. I, I swore like a trooper. <laughs> Okay, and that's unusual or? Yeah, because my father was very strict, Aria. Girls, if they're, if they're my daughters, they, they don't, you know, they, they look pretty, but they don't say anything. So it was, um, it was a release. Okay, yeah, so that, so you found your voice and your anger and your, your rebellion. Finally, as you say, because 11, it was stunted and all of a sudden, rah, you found your raw. I found my raw, but um, it did get out of hand, the raw, because I was, <laughs> I was, I was effing everywhere I was going. And then eventually, <laughs> yes, but when you hear it, you see, and you've got, you know, this kind of um, background that's very disciplined, you then think, oh gosh, that doesn't sound well, does it? And eventually, after a month, I quieted it all down, but it's quite, it was quite loud. Fascinating. I think that's really fascinating. I'm a great fan of hypnotherapy and uh, what it can release in us and what it can heal in us. 
um, that's really interesting. And she left Swansea, so I, you know, I've lost touch with her. I mean, she, she probably is somewhere, you know, I could get back in touch with her. But I just found the whole experience quite overwhelming because she was a Buddhist and I didn't know that. Um, and the effects of the hypnotherapy were quite, you know, traumatic, but in a good way. So I was living that for some time and I got back on a bike. Oh, did you? Fantastic. Yes. I mean, that, I mean, that shows you, doesn't it? Of the, I mean, I'm such a fan of, um, you know, obviously doing the inner work, you know, and when you do the inner work, then it, it's not always pretty, is it? It's, it's, it's sometimes you have to go through, you know, you're going through the darkness and the, you know, but it, you pop up at the other end. And, and things are better, rearranged, but better. So this is coming back to timing with Susie Greaves at the time. I was obviously during the counselling course, you would look at uh, books and what books meant to you, what the titles of the books, and, you know, which of the books meant anything to you. So Tuesday with Maury was my main one. Oh, yeah. Because I did the Carl Rogers uh, person centred. That was the course I did. Yeah, lovely. Ram Das. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cooper Ross. Yeah, the grief cycle. Yeah. Um, I Monty Python came into it because the people I love, <laughs> Life of Brian with Monty Python. Yeah. 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 Basil Forty. You know, <laughs> all, in, I would cry laughing. Billy Connolly. Yeah, yeah. Billy Connolly. Yeah. Eddie Izzard. Yeah. Well, they say laughter, laughter therapy is huge. Yeah. So. Along comes this book on the shelf in a book um, store. And I can't remember which bookstore I got it from. I, I will one day and I'll let you know. And then it was Susie Greaves making the big leap. And I thought, yes, I need to make a big leap now. So, um, come back to you, big leap. Oh my God, that's the original book. That is the original, because it's been republished since then, several times, so. <laughs> um that's the, you've got the original book there and i'd love it i'd love it sign please fine but anyway we'll meet and i'll sign it once this awful covid's finished we'll yes meet but up. that that's you so what this did to me uh inspirational lady you are aspired me you know to aspire to do something my father was an area of pilot and i i have this adrenaline um that it's a speed queen. I love speed. So anything I'm on, if I drive a car, I've got this adrenaline. If I'm in a plane, I've got this adrenaline. But I've learned the hard way, Susie, that not everybody has the adrenaline for the planes. Because my son, when I go on holiday, um, my daughter worked in, in Mallorca. So she'd say, come and have a little break here, you know. So with the two of us, right. we'd get in a plane. But he'd be the opposite of me. I'd be like, let's get on the plane. And he'd be like, there's rust on the wing. There's something on that. And then I'd go, no, 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 no. We're going on the plane. And he'd go, no, there's something up there. And he'd look at the structure of the plane and, and make up all these things that, you know. So adrenaline, back to adrenaline, back to the book. I wanted to jump out of an aeroplane because to me, that would have been the best thing I could have done in terms of aspiring in terms of um, in, inspiring, why? My lecturer at college is Dilly Dance, we called her. She was dra dance drama. She's now, I think, 89 plus, but she jumps, she does all the, the, the jumps for this particular charity. So uh, she's been on um, YouTube, lots of her clips are on it. So she does it herself. And she has aspired, you know, in, in terms of, people that I look at, it's yourself, it's people like Dilly Dance. And then when I see it on television, or if I see it on a, on a broadcast, that, that's what inspires me to do something. So I try and jump out of an aeroplane, I book the ticket, my daughter buys me one, and every time I'm stopped for some reason. And then along comes this son of mine, and then does this. Wow. So, that was, he says that's 17 years ago. And then he tells me that was in the French Alps. So that was part of my birthday present. 
Um, and it only came out of the box yesterday. I've, I've had it in a box. And it, wow. only, it only came out yesterday. Amazing. So back to you making the big leap. Well, all I would say about, can I just say something about the jumping out of an airplane thing? You know, it is really scary. I've done it once. Um, I had a story that I was doing for a, a, a paper and they, they said, do you want to go and jump out? So I did. And we went up and I, I thought, you know what? I forgot I'm really scared of heights. I thought, oh, I've changed my mind. And they're like, no, you can't change your mind. And then I had to jump out. And the man who I was attached to happened to be the man who'd taken Tom Cruise um, jumping out the, the, the week before when he was just saying how amazing he was and how brave he was. And then we got down, talking about swearing, we got down, to be, I did it, I flew, I came back down to earth, I was attached to him. And he said, I have never known a woman swear as much as you did. <laughs> I was literally cursing all the way down and he was not impressed. Um, you know, so I was being compared very unfavorably with Tom Cruise and it is probably the most terrifying experience of my whole life and I would never ever do it again uh, but I know that lots of people do it so you know I, all I'd say is you know it is a big leap but maybe take a big leap in real life rather than out of a aeroplane because it's not normal to do that it really isn't the, the the closest I've got to it and I have done it because I blogged it and it's it's now up um was to, as it was an invite, and I was blogging a lot about the Gower, because I live near the Gower. And, you know, the Gower Peninsula is the most wonderful coastline. So I think the blogging was getting on, you know, somebody's sort of radar, and it happened to be a cameraman. And his name's Alan um, Jones, and it's, he's got a hyphenated middle name. And he must have been picking up my blogs on Twitter. So he sent me an invite to meet him at the airport when it was sunny one morning. And he said it, have, it would have to be early. And he said, I'll take you micro lighting over the Gower. Wow. So, so I did. Oh, micro lighting. I think that would be cool. I think micro lighting is amazing. You should do it, Susie. Yeah, no, that, I think that would be cool rather than throwing yourself out of an airplane, because at least you've got some control with micro light. Yeah, well, he was in control. Uh, yeah. I, I remember the middle name, Alan Morris Jones. So he was a cameraman for S4C and he's got, he had Gower Scapes, which was his. So, the, you know, aerial photography, incredible. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah, and I got a yeah. lot of it. I got a lot of his photographs. I, I'm still in touch with him on LinkedIn. So he says to me, meet me at the, the airport at such and such a time, and it'd have to be clear visibility like today, um, blue skies, wear something warm, and that was it, you see? So I go, I didn't realize, I never, you, you don't realize what you're going into, do you? You don't. <laughs> so, so I go along and he luckily, you know, he has uh, spare suits, red suits for jumpers. So yeah. he said, uh, you, you'd need to be in a suit. He said, I got one. And of course, because I'm only five foot three, it would have to be a small one. So he says, is this all right for you? I said, yes, anything. I just wanted to get up in the plane. I said, yes, yes. yes. So I put the suit on. So I'm in a red suit. And then he's obviously well-trained. And then you've got to go through a training. Then it was like yeah. a 15 minute training. Yeah. With the, the headset on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So cut a long story short, my adrenaline shoots up to the sky with, with the flight. And I'm in heaven. So the Twitter blog I put was um, Heaven on Earth, courtesy of Twitter. That was the title. So we were there, we're there flying. I'd never done it before. So we're there flying. And he's relaying back to the airport um, guy. So he's, I think Dai, his name was. So he's going, Dai, da, 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 da. Now they were swearing. Dai was swearing all the time. And I was listening to it thinking, oh, my gosh, listen to this. But they were, they were filming. So there was a cameraman filming it. So mm -hmm. Dai, the cameraman. And yeah, yeah. Oh, went, right. All right, yeah, this, that, and the other. So then they do it. They sort of do the circle of the Gower. And then I'm in another world because all I see is the Gower coastline from that height and the birds. Yeah. Because I'm with the birds. And I felt it was like, Susie, I felt it was like dancing with the birds. 
Yeah. So it's out. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible feeling. So he did leave me. He said, do you want to have a go at the boom? And I said, yes, please. So I had a go. I had a go. I think it was about a couple of minutes, maybe, you know, 15 minutes. It's hard work. Yeah. So yes. all I would say to you is hard work because, you know, you're against all this pressure. Yeah, holding on. Yeah. 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 So if you, I, I've not got, I've got very strong legs, but my shoulders were weak. So I was really, you know, like this. Yeah, really hard. Yeah. But the, I would say the summing up of that is how you trust your life to somebody else. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what it is. Thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Susie, what's your why? Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this recently. Um, I think my backstory is I lost my parents when I was a teenager um, to cancer. And I suppose my why was how do you survive, you know, when you have your the world exploded? Um, so my why is always, I turned to self-development to help me survive and therapy and counselling and amazing books and stuff. And I think my why became, no matter how bad it is, there's always help available and it is within it's in within not without so my why is learn learn an inner map for yourself everyone's map is different but create your own inner map and find ways of when you're gloomy or when you're depressed or when you're challenged or whatever these are the tools that you use and there's you know at psychologies that's I suppose everything we do in the magazine is providing those tools and it might not it might be sea swimming it might be going on a micro light it could be all of those things but for me it's like there's always hope and there's always um there's always you don't have to stay in that dark place um even if it's kind of physiological um i was just watching that amazing amazing film on netflix the other day about the lovely lady who um she um broke her back when she was in, in New Zealand. Um, it's called Penguin Bloom, the film. Can I write um, that down? Bear with me, Susie. Penguin, Penguin Bloom, it's great. It's, it's a true story and it's about um, a woman called Sam. I can't remember her second name, but she broke her black back. She was a mother and she was a, you know, a worker and a wife. And um, she broke her back while she was in Thailand and then she had to find her way back when everything was taken away from her in an instant. And it's a really moving, inspirational story. Um, so I think there, you know, when people are struggling and, you know, need to find a way back from healing, sorry, come back from tragedy, that you can heal. And I suppose that's my message and my why is because that's what I did. So, yeah. Lovely. Who would you say? looking at your pathway, your journey, has been inspirational to you? Um, I mean, I think my number one inspiration, who I turn to constantly, funnily enough, is a Buddhist, um, a Buddhist nun called Pema Chodron. And I have all of her books and I um, try and go to all of her, you know, online lessons if she has any and, I just constantly, I, I've been lucky enough to secure her for our back page at Psychologies as well, which has been amazing. Um, but I find everything that she writes to be um, totally makes complete sense to me. And it's not because it's Buddhist, because I'm not a Buddhist officially, but I just find her wisdom to be, um, just makes sense to me and so when I'm really struggling I always just read her stuff and then I just I I, I find her quotes all the time really comforting just I mean so it's, 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 she's quite harsh because she's basically saying there is no certainty like life there is no certainty in life get used to it and which allows you to be in the now so you know and I'm always trying to get certainty you know I'm always stewing about the past and looking to the future so I, and those places don't bring me any peace so it's just bringing myself back to center constantly to, oh yeah, remember there's no certainty. All right, bring myself back to the present. And her words help me live a little bit more in the present, not all the time. <laughs> you, you're probably doing better than I am because I find um, I can be in the now. So I've obviously been a Deepak Chopra 21 day 
challenger in terms of, I think that was seven, eight, nine years ago, I started doing Deepak, 21 day challenge. So to turn the adrenaline down, it, you know, is a big deal. And it's to do with the voice. So coming back to the hypnotherapist, some hypnotherapists have got that and some haven't, but Deepak's voice for me works. So that's one. Um, Gabby Bernstein for me works not with her voice for a relaxation, but in terms of where she's been and where she, she's arrived currently. So she's inspired me. Um, Oprah equally for the same reason in terms of what she's gone through and become who she is. And Lewis Howes is another one. I don't know if you've come across Lewis Howes. I love I Lewis. Yeah. I mean, I interviewed Lewis Howes. I've interviewed Oprah. I've interviewed Deepak. I've, yeah, I've, I've been very, very privileged that I've got to interview all of these amazing, amazing gurus. They are incredible. But Lewis Howes, I find his story to be totally incredible. Okay. Yeah. So you and me both. And then the other one, I've got to mention this person because he's really changed me to a certain extent and how I think is Dr. Joe um, Dispenser. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know his work. Yeah, I've never interviewed him. He, he did during COVID, and I suppose because of the age group, he did um, a meditation called Love, you know, just love. And, and so the whole thing is about love. And um, I picked it up because I was obviously going through a little bit of a blip there. And I kept listening to it because it's on YouTube and it's it's quite, hypnot you know, it, it hypnotizes you because it's repetitive. Yeah, he's, he's got some really great theories. Uh, yeah. great. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. Coming back to you in terms of um, your digital presence, I'm impressed by you, by what I see your colours, because you've got lovely orange, which is, is it orange, am I right? Red. It's red, sorry. I see it as orange. Um, and you light up that square because of the colours. Uh, tell me, you. tell me how you fit into the digital era in terms of, would you say because of your work that you're a seasoned signature person? I mean, for me, I, I feel like I'm right at the beginning in terms of a digital journey. I, I'm learning how to do it um, and I'm just learning it bit by bit. You know, last year I learned how to do Facebook Lives and doing interviews on Facebook Live, which was really cool. But, I, you know, learning it. And Lucy Griffiths um, became actually my business partner as well. Um, she talks about confident on camera. And so she helped me a lot about, I mean, I've got actually got a ring light on here. Look, can you see? Watch, watch this. Uh, let me switch it off. All right, if I switch this off, you can see how old and craggy I look. Hang on. Look. Yeah, yeah. There. It's a lot to do with lighting, but I've tried that. Yeah, that it's different. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's like tricks and ticks. Look. Yes. Yeah. And then all your wrinkles disappear. Yeah. Love There's it. There's only your wrinkles, can I just say. And you haven't got any, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Coming back to wrinkles, the person for me, when I um, started getting really unwell, reacting to the Pfizer, was Trini Woodhall. Because I'd put Trini on in the morning and Trini had had COVID and Trini would have her circles under her eyes and that kind of thing and say, you know, this is what you can do, this is what you can do. And because she's so funny and because she's like me, hopping in a taxi, jumping here, going there, I identified with a lot of her mannerisms and personality traits. So, and it's new to me. I mean, I really just started following her. She, she lifted me because I felt really um, unwell inside and I was, so, you know, that was the truth. But at the same time, my mind wanted and was searching for somebody who has answers, who's got who has solutions. And I think Trini in that respect from a, well, Trini is kind of my, I would say, I mean, she's talking about what you look like on the outside, but what I find really interesting about Trini is she's an ex-addict. So I find that really interesting because she's come from a very dark place and she's, I'm really interested in her because of her journey, but I'm not, I, I find the whole, if you just put this cream on and do that, then 
you know, then your life will be better. I know that that's cool, but it's just not my thing. We just don't even, we don't even really put that in much in psychologies at all. I, I'm not saying that, you know, but that's just not my thing. I don't, I don't find all of that interesting at all. So. I do it purely because of the movement, because I've been to London to get retrained four times. And every time I go to London, it means get off in Paddington, go in a taxi, get into, and it's always this kind of popping in and out. Yeah. But, so that's yeah. how I see it. So mentioning that, Brian Rose was the person that got me to go to London to do London Reels, uh, Speak to Inspire. So have you, have you interviewed him? No, I don't know him. Who's Brian Rose? That, that's an interesting one, Susie. A lot I don't of know people, him. But you're not the only one. A lot of people, if I say Brian Rose, I expect people to go, oh, yes. They don't know him. Brian Rose is founder and own, owner of London Real. And at the moment, Brian is campaigning to become a London mayor. Ah, okay. An independent London. I, I haven't heard of it, and I haven't heard that. I I didn't even so I didn't even know that there was a like um whatever it's called a uh, a campaign. I didn't know that. It's massive. So it's it's on uh, Facebook. If you just type in Brian Rose. All his okay, I'll all look him up. Yeah, I'll look him up. I don't, I, I haven't heard of him, so that's cool. I didn't know Steve Kahn that there was, he was, that was changing. So, okay, that's yes. interesting. Well, what he's, uh, don't quote me because I don't know the facts. I'm just quoting you what I see Brian Rose and he's doing it constantly, every day. He's going to every borough. He's, you know, the Wandsworth, he's going to Hackney, he's going to wherever. And he's got the big bus and he's, because he's very flamboyant. He comes from New York. And he was Hello. banking in New York. Okay. And he came, he was an addict. So in his self-confession, he only confessed a couple of years ago. He was a heroin addict. Wow. And, um, he, he knew, he, he'd overdosed twice. And he knew that if that, and his parents didn't know he was an, a heroin addict because he'd gone from, from alcohol because he was into uh, the banks as work. He would just uh, work, 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 go home, drink, go back to work. And that was the cycle. So from drink, he then went to heroin. So somebody offered him heroin. So he became this heroin addict, was overdosed twice. And then he himself realized, I can't keep pushing this. And the parents didn't know. So it was all a secret. And then he came to London. So he came to London in 2006. And he said he did that because he wanted to get away from the temptation of heroin and people in, in that kind of uh, world. Yeah. So he was being, he's been clean since 2006. But what he does now, he's done the Iron Man and he's got Iron Mind as premier. And he's got all these courses that speak to inspire. Um, it's to do with broadcast yourself. So that's the second one, the life, okay. life accelerator and business accelerator. So he's got four courses. Okay. So I did one of them. And as a result of that, I realized I was camera phobic because if the lights are on me and the heat starts, and then I start thinking about the light and the heat, I will just forget what I'm going to do because I'm, all I'm thinking about is what's going to happen next. So he was the one that understood it and said, no, you, you know, you do this, you do that. And we went through all the therapies of what you do, got to the studio and there were 50 other people there from all over the world. So I felt, I didn't know them. So it helped because I didn't know them. I thought I've got to do this. So I spoke and I, the speech was about the homelessness, had, um, the figures of homelessness had risen through the roof. So that was 2017. And there were lots of people dying in Swansea Lots of people dying in Cardiff, lots of people dying in London. And I thought, I've got to be the voice for that. So I did the speech on homelessness and I got them to meditate at the end because you have your, your group as the audience. So they were sat there and you have to do a call to action. And I was struggling on call to action because for me, action is moving. So I was uh, tutored into um, a meditation. And he said, well, why don't you do a meditation? So Deepak Chopra helped from meditation. Um, 
And then I got them all to do it in the studio, including Brian. And it worked. It worked for me as well. Because I, I couldn't believe how powerful it was. I think it was, I mean, again, you know, what you're talking about is learning skill. Well, what I'm understanding is when you learn skills, um, you know, it can only help you. And it, I think it's, for me, my message is definitely about finding people who can support you, help you learn skills. You know, some things are innate and some things you can just learn how to do. Um, so, I mean, I was terrible when I was doing interviews at first, but I've got a lot better. So it's just about, it's just something you learn. So I think it's great that can, people can do that. Yes. It's it's picking something that works, I think, at the end of the day. It's something actually yeah, it works for you. I think different things, what I in my experience, I, I'm not saying I'm right, but I think people find different things that work for them. And it's just it's being able to, you know, just trust your instincts about, you know, what, you know, I always work with a thing of heart leap, heart sink. You know, does this make my heart leap or does it make my heart sink? And you know, just go towards that. In terms of the book, um, your your book. What would you say you were, what, what is the true message from Susie in this book, apart from the fact that there's so many, so many things that are wonderful? What would you say? I think the main thing is, is just have the courage to make a leap. And, and, and a leap is not necessarily, um, the leap is the shift inside your head. So it's a shift from listening to your inner pessimist to living, listening to your inner coach. Um, you know, believing that it's possible for you, changing your beliefs or finding a new belief system it's it's really um and and then taking action from there because sometimes you can make a leap and you know move to a different continent or um take a new job on but without without um without making the leap in your head you know believing that you're good enough for example then everything will just stay the same currently are you writing anything yes i am I'm writing, I'm writing a book um, about my year on the canal boat. Wonderful. Yeah, so I am. Are we talking about the Thames? Yes, I was in, um, but it wasn't the Thames, it was the Grand Union Canal, but um, I didn't quite get onto the Thames, but yeah, I was in London for a year. Yeah, it was brilliant. I had a fantastic time. I learned many life lessons along the way. So that's what I'm writing at the moment. Have you watched... Um, Gareth Edwards, our legend rugby player, with his wife, do similar. Yeah, I'm on a canal boat. Yes, I think I've seen that. I've caught a couple of episodes of, I'm not quite sure who they were, but it, it might be, yes. Gareth Edwards is, a, is the legend for Welsh rugby because, ah, okay. you know, he'd, he'd score all, all the tries. He would grease lightning. But he's married to a lovely lady called Maureen. So I obviously sort of followed documentaries and I realised they were on and I didn't realise how funny they are. They are so funny. I'll have a look. I'll see if I can find it. Yes. It's thing to, to learn about canals. Well, they it, it's, back, it's back to what I, we, we were talking about earlier. Somebody was teaching and somebody who was um, motivating them. So Marie, yeah. his wife, motivates him. Uh, and then okay. he tells right, her... Yeah. Yes, because she's yeah. small, you know, petite, yeah. most of us are in a small uh, stature. She can't do certain things. So he's laughing at her. When, he, when she can't do it, you know, in terms of how they're yeah. navigating or tying up the rope, she can't do it as well. So he laughs at her. So it's all on camera. And it's really uh, brilliant to watch in terms of um, admiration, I think, for somebody. And they're in their 70s because he was in my college. Um, um, so obviously, no, it means a lot to me. So coming back uh, to you, to you, what makes you happy? Where is your happy place? My happy place is my bed. <laughs> I love my bed. Um, nice place. I, yeah, I, you know, people talk about sleep hygiene, about not eating, not doing. Yeah, I do everything bed. I, I, I eat there. I sleep there. I have the dog there. We have meetings in the bed. I. I write in bed, I do everything. I love my bed. It's just that kind of place where I, it's thing. I would say that's my happy place. Isn't that wonderful? What, what would you say is the next kind of challenge for you that you, you set yourself for the next kind of step? My next challenge I think is, um, I've just bought a camper van. So I've sold the canal boat and I've got a camper van. So I am, um, going traveling in the camper van I think is my next challenge my son's just going to university 
and uh, he'll be going in September and I'm going to use that freedom to go traveling in my camper van I think. Is it just one son you've got Susie? Yes one boy. It's yeah an important, it's an important time how would you say that feels for you with your single child your only child leaving the nest? Um, I think I, I'm, I've been a single mother as well. So it's been quite intense, you know, to be the single mother of a single child. So I've been very um, wary of um, not kind of uh, trying to make him the man of the household and stuff. So I think it's really healthy that he's going off um, and, you know, studying and I will hold it together. And I think that's why I need a plan for when he goes. So, I, you know, to go in a, you know, on a, on a, on a trip and, and, create a new adventure for my life because it's as we know parenting is really tough um and you know as much as we adore them but it's like you, I have a massive sense of relief that I've got him over the line and he's in one piece and he's he's okay and he's thriving and he's good and so I I feel I feel like I'm sure I'm going to be devastated when he actually goes but I, I know that I have to let him go because that's healthy and right. And um, we have a good relationship with friends as well. So I, I hope that we will go and connect and he will will keep meeting up wherever we are and he'll come back, you know, in other holidays. That'll happen. Uh, just for me to um, give you one example of my letting go of my son who had joined the paratroopers out of the blue, it wasn't something that was planned because he was set on a course of hospitality and catering. He's a very good chap. So he decided he would join the paratroops. And when he went overseas, I decided like you, when you said you've got to do something, to, to do something, not to keep thinking about him the whole time, um, worrying about him the whole time. So I, I'm part of the Academy, which is Thomas Power and Penny Powers Academy. And I met a Dutch man called Cornelis and Cornelis uh, would recommend sailing. And I, I'm taught, I, I did do my certificate as a sailor. So that really excited me. And I thought, right, we'll do that. And he said, well, we do have a boat that sails around the Turkish coastline. And I, obviously, I, you know, I'm not a seafaring person. I'm a lake person and, a, you know, salt water kind of thing. So I thought, well, that, 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 that'll challenge me. So I did do it. I, I flew to Bodrum and called the Flakataka. So it was this sailing ship. And we did sail around the whole of the Turkish coastline. And I, I cannot say enough about that experience because it was the best holiday I have ever, ever, you know, experienced. Eating fresh fish for me, eating fresh fruit from the market, and then dipping in the sea and having your wine or your, your gin uh, served to you down on a tray while you're swimming in the sea. For me, it was total heaven. So, you know, I think- oh, like celebrating, are... isn't it? Celebrating yes. and taking some time, uh, some space between the transition between one life and another. And I think it sounds like your holiday was that. Yes. And, and I do believe you, you need to address that rather than ignore it. You know, if somebody's saying to you, well, would you like to do this? Because there was no way a couple of years ago I'd have thought, well, that's a good idea. But this was tempting, too tempting. And I think it was about Academy members. I was a black star with Thomas and Benny. And I trusted the process. I'd never, I'd never been to Turkey, but I trusted the whole process and um, it worked. And I had fun, lots of fun. So yeah. I wish you lots and lots and lots of fun. Thank you. And I wish your son great success. Ah, oh, well, fun. yeah, he's a wonderful boy. So, um, yeah. I, I'd love to find out more about how he, he does and that kind of thing. And thank you so much for honouring me. And Thank you for a... having me. And it's so lovely to hear, you know, going back all those years um, that the book. And that's really lovely to hear. Um, yes. Thanks for having me. That's wonderful. And the name of your current book? Did remind me? Don't know yet. Don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. I. I. I it might be a, a love letter to my son. So it might be dear Charlie. So yeah. I, I'd love that. 
but I'll be buying that. Can you see this? What came in the post this morning? I don't oh, know. Oh, Carolyn's it. gin. <laughs> that came in the post this morning. Wonderful. Oh, that's great. I didn't expect it. I, I opened it. I thought, what's this? And when it's I a sign. It, <laughs> like, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.